really want to focus on Baltimore City Schools. I, I mean, the time for excuses has so long passed, but Baltimore City Schools still making Baltimore City Schools make excuses that they would not take from their students. Baltimore City Public Schools, they they do things that they would not allow their students to do, but they want you, the parents, they want you, the public, to uh, agree to and, and, and turn the other cheek while they uh, just ill-prepare our young people for the world. Yes. So, so we've, we've talked about it in multiple shows has talked about uh, some of the atrocious test scores for students in Baltimore city. So Baltimore city public schools. Now the Baltimore city school system, which I'm a product of many of you are products products of, uh, but we have uh, listeners from across the country, but uh, the school system here in Baltimore is slamming the media. They're pushing back against the media for reporting that some schools, uh, you know, there, there were there were at some schools, there were no students who reached proficiency levels in math on the latest MCAP standardized tests. Oh, and so they're trying to, you know, uh, I because it makes them look crazy. It makes it look bad. I, I would say that you got one job and that's to educate the students. I would say you got one job and that is to prepare these students to take tests. But our school officials have posted their statement on their website and they're accusing the media of writing what they call inflammatory summaries and headlines to earn internet clicks and attributing the reports to what the statement calls a repeatedly ill-intentioned news outlet. Okay, so that's Fox 45. Now, you know I always slam Fox 45, right? Now, this happens to be something that On Fire TV and Fox 45 agree on. That is the conditions of Baltimore City Public Schools. The job that they are doing is not sufficient. And as I said, Baltimore City Public Schools make statements. And the Baltimore City school system makes excuses that they would not accept from their students. They wouldn't accept these, these excuses. Listen to some of this hoopla. So they say, overall, the district closed the gap with the state of Maryland in seven of 14 tested grades and subjects, generally math and English language arts, between 2019 and 2022. We were encouraged, but neither pleased nor satisfied, reads the statement. Okay, so if that's the case, what are you talking about right now? What, what about uh, the summaries that have been uh, put online, the summaries that have been put over the airways, the summaries that have been broadcasted about the failure of the Baltimore City public school system, what about that is wrong? Why does the school system want to pat on the back? If your student was, they got seven out of 14 right, you would fail them. Baltimore City public schools, you are failing based on your own metrics. You said seven out of 14 tested grades and subjects generally math and English. I, I mean, I, I, what I'm not understanding is why the Baltimore City public school system wants us to give them a pass that they would not give their own students. The report by Maryland State Department of Education from January showed that test scores for students returned to pre-pandemic performance levels in English but not in math. Now, that could be because they got them doing that bogus math, which doesn't even make sense in the first place. Math is math. These students need to be prepared to do math in the real world, not some convoluted, stupid system that, that some liberal drew up 
and, and has just sold this bill of goods to, to school systems. They need to understand regular math that they're going to have to do in society when they become adults. So that's a big part of the reason why they are not proficient. Parents can't help them with this stupid math that, that they're teaching in schools now. And the students don't understand it. And it seems that the teachers can't even teach them this stupid math. They need to teach these students how to do math that is going to be applicable in their life. That is the math that you learned when you were in school and the math that I learned when I was in school. Basic math, one, two, three, six, seven, eight, that kind of stuff, right? Addition, subtraction, multiplication, you know, some algebra, that kind of stuff. But this core, common core, whatever this, this crap is, that's part of the problem. So these Maryland Comprehensive Assessment Program results, atrocious, atrocious. And these so-called educated people uh, in, in Baltimore City Public School System, the higher-ups, the ones that are making all this money, making excuses. According to the report, the percentage of students proficient in math in grades 3 through 8 dropped from 33% in 2018-2019 school year to 22% last year. Oh, my God. And, and here's the thing. I, I, teachers do a, a, a very important job, but you are also talking about teachers are underpaid. Teachers need raises. I mean, what kind of job are the teachers doing? Now, I'm not letting parents off the hook because parents are a big part of this problem. 50% because you also need to reinforce what the students are learning in school. You can't just put it all on the teachers and then teachers have to do their job as well. But this calls for parents reinforcing what was learned during the day. Parents need to be involved. I understand that you work. I understand you got other things to do, but you also have to be invested in your child's life and not just, their cell phone and, and, you know, that kind of stuff and clothes. And but there's other things that you got to be invested in as well. Or you're not going to get the results. We can't blame it all on, on the school system, but the school system is atrocious. I'm not letting any of them off the hook. Since the 2021-22 school year, City Schools has invested more than $17 million in what they're calling high dosage tutoring, high dosage tutoring. And this is as a, uh, a critical academic recovery strategy, they wrote in the statement. So if you all put 17 million in what you call high dosage tutoring, and you're getting these kind of numbers, you are wasting money. See how people try to say money is the answer. Money is not the answer only. You can throw a whole lot of money at the wrong thing, and it's still going to be messed up. You guys take the money and spend it on the right things. So as I said, according to the report, the percentage of students proficient in math in grades three through eight dropped from 33%, which was in the trash can. 33% of the students are proficient in math, and they were excited about that. So that has dropped 10%. So now it's only 22% of third graders through eighth graders can do the damn math. No, no, something's wrong with this picture. Something is wrong with this picture. Since the 21 to 22 uh, school year, they said that they invested 17 million in high dosage tutoring. High dosage tutoring, what does that even mean? No, no, to me, 17 million was put in somebody's pocket. So was, because we're not seeing the results of it. We're not seeing the results. So uh, four schools in Harlem Park, um, uh, they're talking about this. Uh, Augusta Fell Savage Institute for Visual Arts, Harlem Park Elementary Middle, uh, Bluefoot Drew, Jimson, STEM uh, Academy West, and Career Academy. Uh, you know, these, I, I just, it, it's so frustrating. It's so frustrating to hear these so-called educated people lie like common criminals 
and, and, and make excuses as to what's happening with the money. Because they want to throw this out. We spent 17 million. What does that mean? 17 million. Uh, really? 17 million. Could you give us an accounting for where the 17 million went for this high dosage tutoring? I think that if they spent zero dollars on high dosage tutoring, they would have gotten the same results, which was nothing. Nothing. It is an embarrassment. The Baltimore City Public School Systems is a disgrace. A disgrace. But they continue, the district has expanded professional development for teachers. What does that mean? What, what professional development is happening when the test scores now are lower than they have ever been? Lower than they have ever been. If they claim to be focusing on math, similar to what has uh, already uh, you know, been committed to literacy. Part of the problem is we have to get back to basics. Get back to basics. You know? Uh, now, regarding the scores, Mayor Brandon Scott issued the following statement. He said that there is a lot of work to be done in city schools, and they know that. But that work is just not on city schools alone. That's on all of us to do that for our young people, the mayor says. Everybody that says that they care about young people in the city of Baltimore should be stepping up to help. Now, of course, Mayor Scott is a friend of the show. He's been on the show several times. Uh, I, for the most part, I agree with that statement. The mayor said that there's a lot of work that needs to be done in city schools, and they know that. Okay, I agree with that. The mayor also says that that work is not just the job of the city schools alone, even though they're paid to do it. But he said it's not just their job. It's for all of us. I definitely agree that parents play a big part in this. Parents can't just send their kids to school, drop them off at school, put them on some bus, kick them out the house for a few hours and not reinforce what is taught. It is hand in hand. And if more parents were reinforcing what is taught, they would be able to catch the crap that is being sold to, uh, to the uh, citizens of Baltimore. And that's what it is. It is a load of crap. We have folks that are stealing our money. I say stealing because they have millions and millions and millions of dollars, and we don't see any results. We're seeing worse results now than there have ever been. That is a problem. Now, whether you are a conservative outlet like Fox 45, who I agree with hardly nothing that they say, we agree on this, uh, that the school systems uh, right now, the performance currently uh, needs a lot of work. A lot of work. Uh, so let's see, go to comment. Uh, Dominic Stokes says, get Brandon Scott out of here. All right, now, you know, we're not really talking about Brandon Scott's uh, job per se. Uh, we're going to have a, a whole lot of conversation on that because he's going to be running for re-election uh, in the uh, 2024 race. You're, we're going to have plenty of time to analyze the job that he has done, uh, but it seems like uh, Dominic Stokes is not a fan of Brandon Scott. So who who <laughs> who needs to be the mayor? If, if you don't think it's Brandon Scott, uh, are they going to start talking about bringing Sheila Dixon back? Is that what's going to happen? Uh, I, I'm interested to see that. This is going to be a very, very interesting uh, election coming up. Oh, I'm going to make some predictions here. Theru Vignaraja, who's been on the show a few times, I think that Theru Vignaraja is going to run again. Uh, that's that's a He's, he's a, a friend of Fox 45. I mean, he's a friend of the show as well. I, I don't have any, any anything personally against him. Uh, and as I said, I, you know, he's been uh, here to the show several times. He brought his father uh, a couple times. Uh, but I just think that he gets behind uh, some he gets behind some uh, topics that uh, I, I don't know. I don't I need to have another conversation with him. It, it's been a while since I've had a, a chance to chop it up with him. Uh, but I'm predicting that he is going to be running uh, for that job. He, he ran for it before. Um, and so uh, uh, Stokes, uh, Dominic Stokes is saying, yes, bring back Sheila Dixon. I'm sure Sheila Dixon would like to come back. <laughs> I'm sure that Sheila Dixon would like to come back. Uh, but like I said, we, we have the uh, the 2024 race 
which is a presidential race. It's also going to be one that uh, the city of Baltimore is going to be selecting their next mayor. Uh, so that is going to be interesting. Uh, so we're going to do this. We're going to take a quick break, and then we're going to come back, and we're going to talk about uh, the Baltimore City Schools CEO and uh, some recommendations that she wants to make. She she thinks she knows. She don't, I don't know what she knows, but uh, she, she's a smart lady. I understand that. She knows how to get that money. She's getting some money. She, she knows how to get some money out of the city of Baltimore. But we're going to talk uh, more about her. We come back right after this on the Diamond K Show. Stay tuned. Or did their family, the one thing we know is that none could argue that they had not benefited from discrimination, which, of course, is a direct byproduct of slavery. So... Uh, this is a quote from a New York Times, a quote published by the New York Times, written by uh, Julius Awangum. It's, it's an excerpt from his college uh, admissions essay. So it says, but let me paint a picture. Let's say your great-great-grandmother was a newly liberated slave in 1863. How free is she truly? She might be free but the world doesn't, still doesn't have to treat her equally. No one is obliged to give her a job. She is the same person she was the week before. And her kids, they are now growing up with a mother who can't read or write, while at the same time struggling to live in a society evolving to house a new race. Are her children supposed to immediately succeed? And what about their children? and their children. So now we're in the period of um, reconstruction, of which we're not going to talk a whole lot about. But I, again, because of the Black Lives Matter and the death of George Floyd, I found in the Library of Congress this incredible picture um, where we have um, a black soldier, actually, sprawled on the American flag. And he's got three different people's feet on him. And this is dated from 1868. So the idea of a police having their feet on a black person has been going on probably since the beginning. Um, so now I would like to talk about Jim Crow. Um, who was Jim Crow? And I'm assuming most people really don't know who Jim Crow is. So Jim Crow was a... Um, folk person from a um, uh, song that was sung um, and the theater performer in 1828 based his character on Jim Crow, a folk trickster who had been popular among enslaved black people. There was a traditional slave, slave song called Jump Crow, Jim Crow. The character is dressed in rags and wears a battered hat and torn shoes. Rice applied black face makeup made of burnt cork to his face and hands and impersonated a very nimble and irreverently witty African-American field hand who sang, Come listen, all you gals and boys. I'm going to sing a little song. My name is Jim Crow. Wheel about and turn about and do just so. Every time I wheel about, I jump Jim Crow. Jim Crow laws were state and local laws that enforced racial segregation in the southern United States from the late 19th century and early 20th centuries by white democratic dominated state legislatures to disenfranchise and remove political and economic gain made by blacks during the Reconstruction period. The Jim Crow laws were enforced until 1965. These laws mandated racial segregation in all public facilities in the states of the former Confederate States of America and in some others beginning in the 1870s. They were upheld in 1896 in the case of Plessy versus Ferguson, um, in which the U.S. Supreme Court laid out its separate but equal legal doctrine for facilities for African Americans. Moreover, Public education 
had essentially been segregated since its establishment in most of the South after the Civil War. The legal principle of separate but equal racial segregation was extended to public facilities and transportation, including the coaches of interstate trains and buses. Facilities for African Americans were consistently inferior and underfunded compared to the facilities for white Americans. Sometimes there were no facilities for them at all. As a body of law, Jim Crow institutionalized economic, educational, and social disadvantages for African Americans living. It says in my script in the South, but I would say that the discrimination is pretty universal even today. Jim Crow laws and Jim Crow state constitutional provisions mandated the segregation of public schools, public places, public transportation, and the segregation of restrooms, restaurants, and drinking fountains for whites and blacks. The US military was already segregated. President Woodrow Wilson, a Southern Democrat, initiated the segregation of federal workplaces in 1913. In 1954, segregation of public schools, state-sponsored, was declared unconstitutional by the U.S. Supreme Court Chief Justice Earl Warren in landmark case Brown versus Board of Education. In some states, it took many years to implement this decision, while the Warren Court continued to rule against Jim Crow laws in other states. Generally, the remaining Jim Crow laws were overruled by the U.S., I'm sorry, by the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Another historical remnant or artifact in East Towson from the era of Jim Crow is the Carver Colored High School, pictured there. And it had started out actually as a school for all kids. I learned actually last year that I have neighbors who went to first and second grade in that building. So essentially, the historical plaque called it a high school because evidently that's what it was by the time it closed due to integration. Okay. Uh, the Freedmen's Bureau, established by Abraham Lincoln in 1865, um, was really the Bureau of Refugees, Freedmen, and Abandoned Lands, um, usually referred to as the Freedmen's Bureau. It was a government agency from 1865 to 1872, which is the period of Reconstruction, um, to, pro to provide direct um, provisions, clothing, and fuel for the immediate and temporary shelter and supply of destitute and suffering refugees and freedmen and their wives and children. The Freedmen's Bureau was an important agency of early reconstruction, assisting the freed people in the South. The school was established in 1857 um, to provide an education for Towson's African American community. Um, but um, the first classes were held in an unused army barracks that had been transported to the site on Hillen Road. Money to support the school would be privately raised as Baltimore County would not appropriate money for the reconstruction of African American schools until 1897. Mm. In the 600 square miles of Baltimore County, all black high school students were bused to one of three schools, either Carver in the center, Sollers Point on the east, or Banneker on the west. And if you wanted to graduate your 12th year of high school, you had to go into the city. It, there was, it only went through the 11th grade. So uh, we're going to introduce you to a few people who are from East Towson. The first was Albert Castle. Albert was an architect. He was born in Towson. His family later moved. Um, he was the son of a coal wagon driver. His father also, Albert Castle, and his wife, Charlotte, um, and attended school. His, his father and mother attended school in East Towson. Young Castle, born in 1895, became a noted architect, which is uh, why we show you this image, a noted architect who practiced 
in Washington, D.C. and designed some of the buildings at Howard University as well as Morgan, Morgan State University. He headed the Department of, Ar of Architecture at Howard and here's the building he was most proud of. And if you can remember uh, Provident Hospital, he designed that also. Oh, and then we have... <laughs> We um, found Bill, another person. Right, that's exactly. So Billy Jones uh, definitely grew up in Towson, actually on, on the same street that I live on now. Uh, he was the first African American to break the ACC color line in uh, basketball at the University of Maryland College Park. And so I think it was 2020, the university renamed its Hill Fieldhouse after Bill Jones and Daryl Hill. Daryl Hill did the same thing for football at the University of Maryland. And so this building, uh, this new athletic center commemorates uh, their achievement. So the last part of our talk is environmental racism at East Towson, <clears throat> which is when you're walking around a neighborhood, one of the artifacts that you see today. Um, the term environment is a term understood as it sets where everything takes place. The environment is defined as where we live, work, play, learn, and pray. Most people want equal access to work, recreation, education, religion, and safe neighborhoods. The racial dimension of environmental inequality surfaces around the question of who has rights to environmental protection and who bears the burden of waste and pollution. Environmental racism can be traced back around 500 years with the arrival of the Europeans and the displacement of Native Americans. Environmental racism can also be identified through sociological theories in which covert organized racial and ethnic oppression develops into environmental injustices or overt racism, which limits the right of people of color to make decisions with regard to the environment in which they live. And sadly, this goes on today in East Towson. So maybe you want to talk about the train. Oh, do you want to? Oh, that one? Yeah. OK. So this is a uh, rendering of the Mon Pond Railroad. This train is a sort of pictorial of this train coming through Towson. Uh, the thing that I think is important to note is that when it was originally, con the, the, the original concept of the Montpel Park Railroad did not cut through the neighborhood. It actually went along what is now Joppa Road, which meant it would not have disrupted the neighborhood at all. But by the time it was actually built, it cut right through the neighborhood and so um, Towson Town Boulevard, which is what you, wh which is what it is today, was the train line for the Montauk Railroad. And so this monstrous vehicle, and you can see on the side, at first when I saw these pictures, I thought those guys were children. And then it dawned on me, the train was so big, that they were actually men. And uh, so it cut right through, you can see the houses on the other side of the street, and C Carol has another image, where you can see the Carver School, which still looks like that. The Carver School still looks like that, and the train coming through, and that train ran through Towson, sometimes up to 16 times a day. Actually, when you go here at the library on the circular uh, walkway, there is a picture of this train going over York Road. It's sort of a very historic picture. Um, and I think the trussel, <coughs> one of the trussels still sits Across the street from the library at the yeah, corner. Yeah, it's in the storage. Mo yeah, yes. When they built the Whole Foods, they yes. set that up. And they so saved yeah. Well, actually, out. historic Towson um, <laughs> saved, <laughs> saved <laughs> the railroad <laughs> abutments. And um, I always think of them as the gates to the medieval city. <laughs> but, it, but it's also highways and things are still run through. Yes. Lower income. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And, and, and we'll get to that because yeah. that happened on Fairmount Avenue in mm -hmm. East Towson. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm not quite sure why the GI 
USGS map is here, but it's what it looked like in 1944. Do you want to? Uh, sure. This is um, Black & Decker, which actually is my neighbor. It sits at the bottom of the hill. Uh, actually, Black & Decker came to this particular area because of the Mon Pong Railroad. It made it easier for them to receive and ship supplies at the time. I think um, they've been in Towson since maybe 1910, and I didn't even realize they had been here that long. Um, that gate you see when I was a kid was not there, so I guess you could say as sort of a, as a way of being a good community partner or neighbor, that gate was not there and we could still access Joppa Road without having to go to Fairmont Avenue and kind of work our way around because our access to Joppa Road was kind of cut off by the building of their campus. However, um, many years ago now, they closed it off and there's a traffic light at the opening so that it's easy for their employees to traffic in and out. But it used to be an enormous procession of cars through the community every day at 4 o'clock. Um, but another perspective on environmental racism argues that there are four factors which lead to environmental racism. Chief among them are lack of affordable land, lack of political power, lack of mobility, and poverty. So this image shows you what houses and housing looked like in East Towson during the same exact time that housing looked like this in South Wind Hills. So that's, a, that's an, an, an image of the disparity. So uh, cheap land is sought by corporations and governmental bodies as a result of communities which cannot effectively resist these corporations and governmental bodies and cannot access political power and not negotiate just costs. Communities with, with minimized socioeconomic mobility cannot relocate. So a lack of financial contributions also <coughs> reduced the community's ability to act both politically, physically, and politically. So <clears throat> in 1964-65, there had been a very large vacant lot in the middle of East Towson. And the rumor is, which we think is correct, that this is where the Negro Leagues may have either played or practiced baseball. Um, but a land speculator owned that property and probably because Spiro, Spiro Agnew, who was the county executive, probably passed a little money back and forth under the table and the, the property was then bought by BG&E for the power substation. And that was a direct um, way of pushing blacks out of Towson. Um, and so in order to um, get enough property for the power substation, they demolished several houses. Here you can see that block with its parcel in the middle. Um, and here are some of the houses that were destroyed. And so from just about anywhere in the neighborhood, you can drive around and you will see the power substation. Um, it sits on two and a half acres of land and is either the front or backyard view for four of the six remaining blocks of East Towson. And then they got the bright idea to widen Fairmount Avenue as it cut through to the Beltway. So this is the intersection on Fairmount where Pennsylvania crosses. And I like to say that the neighborhood got sliced and diced, and this is one of them. One of them. So um, just above this intersection is where they widened, and who knows how many houses they demolished, um, but they could only afford to widen two blocks. So, um, and then there's a couple of office buildings that were, were built there. Another um, thing about uh, the environment in East Towson is that they built apartment houses way too tall. So this is the Bridgely Towers, and it uh, overwhelms the um, viewscape in the neighborhood. And again, you can see it here. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and talk. Yeah, <laughs> so um, we have um, an issue that is going on today that is a civil rights issue where the count, a person owns the only
only vacant lot in East Towson who wants to make some money off of it. And um, so it's pending. It's been tied up in the courts for some time um, to build affordable housing unit that was not only cheaply designed, but it was just much too large for that parcel. So this is the aerial view of Red Maple Place. And this is the drawing of Me the side of Re Red Maple Place. And this is what Red Maple Place looks like from Joppa Road. It just would overwhelm the neighborhood in the back where it would be abutting um, East Pennsylvania. It would be seven stories tall and rather narrow. So it just, what were they thinking of? Plus, to build um, affordable housing in a neighborhood that's already affordable housing. And I will say, we have tried very hard to um, get this um, to not happen. Uh, and we've written a lot to the county executive, and he hears us. But until it's decided in the courts, um, he's not going to be very helpful. So do you want to talk about East Towson today? Or? Sure. Actually, if you could go back to the one with the grass, the trees inside. So this wooded lot extends from Pennsylvania Avenue straight through to Joppa Road. The original address for Red Maple Place was 413 East Pennsylvania Avenue, right? The, the white building that you see um, yeah, yes. is actually the Elks Lodge, <clears throat> which has, uh, that building's been there for 95 years, and the Elks is the oldest and only social club in East Towson. So that big building would have been sitting right next to the Elks Lodge. So um, it was actually pushed back from the community that had the developer flip the address to 405 East Joppa Road, number one. This parcel is not only the only remaining green space in East Towson, it's the only remaining green space in Towson from here to White Marsh. It sits at the headwaters of the western branch of the Herring Run. It's situated literally on top of a stream. And so, and the uh, engineer has no real requirement because the county favors development. It has no real requirement for stormwater runoff. If you pave it over, um, that water doesn't daylight again until Egbert Avenue, which means if water rolls downhill, and we know it does, then the problem may start in East Towson, but it won't end there. Now, somewhere in the neighborhood of four to six homes were lost to flooding on Stevenson Avenue, um, probably not even, barely five years ago. And so it looks like it's an East Towson problem, but I assure you that the uh, gravity of the issue will spread. And our feeling is that if that land that um, the Mangione family has owned since 1983, if it was developable, it would already be developed. There's a, in the, in the pictures that Carol has of um, East Towson today, you'll see signs for a community called Harris Hill, which is a lovely little condo and townhouse development that was built uh, back in the 90s. I think it's maybe 29 years old this year. It was uh, conceptualized to have African-American families who had to leave Towson because of zoning that sort of cornered them out generation after generation to come back. However, when Harris Hill was completed, of the 53 units that were built, only five or six went to African-American families. The rest of it was completely white. And now they do boast a more diverse uh, community. They certainly do have a more diverse community, but still only about five of those units have African-American families in them. Um, so that's, this is actually Railroad Avenue. And on, if you live on Railroad Avenue, your view, as I mentioned earlier, is only the BGE substation. So the... Um, and, they, and they landscaped it with this beautiful fence. And tree. <laughs> and tree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so, um, you know, so the East Towson community uh, continues to, uh, in whatever way we can, continue to,
push on. You know, we're down the six blocks and um, we're working to preserve uh, what's left of what is clearly a history, not only a local history, but a national history. Um, you know, one of the things I like to say to Carol is, though we don't focus on Reconstruction, the bottom line is you have Jim Crow because Reconstruction was working. And black people were, were um, you know, upon their freedom, after all those years of, of brutal subjugation, they managed to just jump right into freedom and, and make the best of their lives as they lives as they could, but maybe they did it. They just went about, they were too good at it, I guess. They were, they were too good at it. So um, that, that uh, greenhouse that you just passed, Carol, is one of the houses in the neighborhood that was built in 1910 and the original family still lives in it. Uh, there's another one down the street from it, belongs to the Mack family, and uh, the grandfather, great-grandfather, was a child slave at Hampton, and uh, he built the house that his family still lives in today. Uh, so those kinds of things, you know, those kinds of structures, families, deep family with deep roots are, are still very much in the community. My own family has been in this house, and I believe I'm the seventh generation. Uh, we mentioned earlier that um, my grandmother said that her mother's generation never talked about slavery. So my grandmother and I were very close. And so I said to her one time, so grandma, who's your grandma? Because I didn't know her, right? And so she said, oh, she said, mama's mother, Annie. She says, Annie was mama's mother. She said, we always believed Annie was a slave, but mom would never talk about it. So it was actually uh, after a conversation with Gregory Wideman, who's the curator at Hampton National Historic Site, who slid me a genealogical flowchart with my family's information on it. It was like, what? So I have ancestry in Towson by virtue of enslavement at Hampton documented back to 1791. So it not only showed, so the one thing I learned uh, that unfortunately I was never able to share with my grandmother because she passed when I learned it, that Annie actually was not born a slave. She was born in 1880, so 15 years or so after slavery happened, but still living a difficult life, I'm sure. So um, Annie was one of 18 uh, children. Her parents and their parents were enslaved at Hampton. And 18 children says to me that Annie was one of 18 children who were bred as slaves. So it was not uncommon for the Ridgelys to uh, not only have slaves, but create families because the offspring of those families were slaves they didn't have to purchase. Do we have a bunch, just a few more um, but, uh, pictures to show you, but there's always some fact that we didn't put in okay. our in our talk. So the one thing I want to leave you with is that how East Towson came to be so populated was that when the slaves at Hampton were freed, the Ridgely family then divided up their land so that the, the former enslaved people could become tenant farmers. And after a generation or two, they realized they could not make a decent living. So they drifted off from the plantation, and many of them came into Towson. Um, and that there are other communities in Towson, we don't see any more Sandy Bottom, but it basically was the Triangle where Joppa Road and um, York Road is that goes north on the other side of the hill here. And um, uh, they, um, I don't know why I've got these pictures stuck in the back here, but. <laughs> Uh, they um, then there's Schwartz Avenue down by the York Road Giant. The Schwartz Avenue was probably started by people who worked for um, a, an estate at the corner of Giddings and Walker Avenue in York Road that was called Drum Castle. So today the name Drum Castle lives in those apartments, but it was a beautiful house. Mm -hmm. um, and it, all along York Road and Charles Street and all over the county were farms and estates. Um, so you get pockets of people that could 
get to work easily. Um, so that concludes our talk. And if there are any questions, um, if you know of any other groups that would like to hear our talk, we love <laughs> to keep giving it. Yeah, I <laughs> and would. we thank you for coming. Yeah, I'd be. Well, yeah, no. thank you.
And so she had hoped to do some investigation. She wanted to do some ground penetrating radar right around the front door of the Carroll Mansion. And when she wanted, to, when she tried to get that specific, they shut her project down. So, um, and, and there was another place on that, on that land that she wanted to investigate. And the next thing you know, she says mysteriously, they decided they needed a parking lot over there. Um, so even the, as you know, maybe many of you have seen uh, on 60 Minutes, they did an expose on highways and shopping centers that had been built over um, uh, cemeteries of African-American people. The, the Laurel Cemetery on, I think it's Bel Air Road. Yes, uh, is, a, is a shopping center that's built over a prominent um, African-American cemetery. Supposedly the graves were moved out to Carroll County. And if, yes. you, and if you go out there, you can see that the headstones are out there, but you would never believe there were bodies under them because they're just situated. They're not situated in a way that's consistent with general, genuine burial. Um, but they did move the... Uh United States Cultures uh, okay. was buried there to the Laurel Cemetery. Okay. okay. Um, I'm sorry, to the, the, uh, the cemetery on um, Frederick Avenue. Oh, got it. Okay, the, the military. The uh, Baltimore so. National Cemetery. cemetery. Yeah. So, so I want to encourage um, you, if you haven't been to Hampton, they have a wonderful um, uh, component of, that speaks to the enslaved people there. And um, at some point, Nancy and I are going to go over to <coughs> the Eastern Shore and look at <coughs> Sodder Lake Plantation. <coughs> but the difference between the Eastern Shore enslavement and Baltimore County is much different because of the geographical location here. And it wasn't um, tobacco growing, or there were areas that grew tobacco, but primarily this area was really the furnace at Hampton, and um, agriculture. Um, but you've got this direct connection from Hampton into East Houston, which I don't know if any other um, enclave in, in the state of Maryland has. And it's, to me, it's just an incredible story. Right, right. So our, right now, our way of developing a commemorative and positive response to this otherwise complicated and difficult history is to create a trail that uh, takes us from Hampton to historic East Houston. So uh, we're calling it the Road to Freedom Trail from historic Hampton to historic East Houston. And it will include 13 types of historic significance that you've seen on this virtual tour that will connect the two places and essentially reveal a history hidden in plain sight. It's like Carol said, if you just meander through the neighborhood, it won't, nothing will really click for you if you don't have the history. That's the interesting thing about history. Um, it's so funny, I had a moment this morning, I took my mom to GBMC for a test. So GBMC is, is doing some construction. And so I was sitting in radiology, a friend was trying to call me and it wasn't working. So I said, wait a minute, let me go to the door. Well, the door is gone because they have closed it off. And if you didn't know, you wouldn't know that there was ever a door there. So I see the woman, uh, the, what do you, the, the, the welcoming person sitting at the admissions desk. And I said, wasn't there a door here? And she says, oh yeah. So I said, great. I opened, I, opened my phone and called my friend because I knew I'd get signal because this is where the door was and surely enough the phone came right on it and I thought you know what Nancy that's history in action if you were just if you didn't know GBMC and you didn't know that there was a door there then you wouldn't stop there to consider that you could get signal and so that's a small way that we interact we could possibly interact with history but to come through East House and with the benefit of this tour, and Bradley, of course, has been on, and, and Barbara have been on our actual tours, our Doors Open Baltimore tour, where you can connect this history at, at least at the point of East House. And all of a sudden, it's like it, 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 it's, it, there's a there there, as they say. And um, 
So you're able to connect the dots on the history, and all of a sudden, there's something worthy of preservation. And you know, even at the executive level of government, I had a liaison from General Shusty's office say, well, we didn't know. And consider, we didn't know, and John Olszewski went to Goucher and studied history. So it's all in what part of history you're studying, right? So I said to her, I said, listen, we are not black people who got good jobs and moved to Towson. We've always been here. The community was established at least three years, at least three years before, the, before county government was established. And then, of course, obviously, we just talked to you know there were people here even before that. So, um, you know, I think that there's a lot of opportunity, especially when you allow, when you use nature and allow people to encounter and take in the history on their own in a non-threatening way. I think it's a fantastic opportunity for uh, not just African American tourism in the area, but also ecotourism, because our trail will stretch from East Towson to Hampton or vice versa, and you've got to be able to get across 695. And so our plan is for there to be a land bridge that connect, that reconnects those two campuses because there was a time when there was obviously no 695 and you could just walk right across the land from one space to another because Goucher, of course, was part of Hampton, the Epsom farm. So I think that you know, it opens up a fantastic opportunity for education, public history, public archaeology, uh, public art, symposiums on the history. It puts Baltimore County, um, Baltimore County and its history on the map in some very powerful and I think constructive ways. And so uh, you can see the brochure on our website if you go to historiceasttowson.org under Freedom Trail, it gives you a, a sort of summary of the project. We are currently in the feasibility study stage of it, so we're working with the Neighborhood Design Center, and we're on our, we just completed our third review with them uh, this past Monday, and we're, that study should be wrapped up by June, which will determine whether it is in fact a feasible project for the land uh, map that it covers. Um, and we're excited about it. We're excited about it. I invite you to go to the website, sign up. We'll keep you posted on what's happening there. There are a lot of excited people who are interested. Kent Devereaux, who's the president of Goucher College, is an avid cyclist and loves the idea. Um, John Olszewski is also a, a um, I would want to call him a partner in the idea. He's certainly divided on the issue of the affordable housing project that uh, kind of brought this whole thing to life. I had Barbara Hopkins, who was then the director of neighbor space, says, well, if you don't want Red Maple there, what do you want? And I said, I'm trying to figure out why there isn't a trail that connects these two places because you don't have one without the other. And quite frankly, Hampton is being celebrated for its Georgian architecture and downplayed for the fact that it was an industrial slave plantation. And yet it's being funded and, and cared for and kept up with federal, state, and probably local dollars. So if it's worth preserving, then how come we don't want to know about the people who helped build it? We're either proud of this history or we aren't. And if we aren't willing to tell the whole story, we can't lift up half of it. We can't lift up half of it. You know, you can't. Uh, what's that old saying? Behind every great man, a great there's woman. a great woman, right? And so, you know, so now women are much more in the forefront, and and we know who these people's wives are. We know who you know, raised these fantastic children. And so, America was built on some pretty complicated uh, and painful stuff. But I think that if we face it, we can transcend it in some really healthy, positive ways. Um, well, I just came back from 10 incredible days in Rome, and one of the things I noticed on a building was plaques about the Jews that had been sent to concentration camps, and all over Europe you see this. But in this country, with the history of enslavement, you 
don't see any mark or very few markers. So especially in the Baltimore area, you don't see where the slave pens were or where remnants of this is. You do see in the plantations now an acknowledgment, and the ranger at Hampton gives a wonderful talk on the enslaved people there. Scathing. But... That's what is scathing. I mean, he just lays it out there. But those are all verbal. There's no signage. We don't have any signs in Towson that say, this is where Sandy Bottom was. You know, there's nothing. So we hope this raises your awareness a little bit. Yeah. And thank you so much for coming. I don't mean to keep you here too long. They're having a fabulous time. Don't have the party too soon. I think before we go, all I want to say is, it's not about, you know, if you put up markers, the same way there's an acknowledgment of the Holocaust, an acknowledgment of slavery is exactly that, it's an acknowledgment. And as I have journeyed this path, one of the things that occurred to me was that history was not just a chronicle of famous places and people and dates. It was a, it was a document on how we've treated each other, how humanity has treated each other throughout history. And so we're at a critical inflection point. And it is very much what people say they don't know about American history that is having people who do want to turn back that clock. And so if you don't know the history, everything looks like nonsense. You know, like Carol's investigation of Black Lives Matter. It's like, what is this? What do you mean Black Lives Matter? Of course they do. We had a black president for eight years. But we don't know that those things are essentially anomalies so that you don't, so that you downplay or you disregard how we got to where we are. So, uh, yeah, we really thank you for coming, uh, for listening, and uh, please share the story. Thank you. <laughs>